I was 13 when I first picked up a rock that would change my life. But before that moment happened, I was a stubborn kid growing up in a crowded house in Slough, a town on the outskirts of London. If you've ever flown from Heathrow Airport, you'll know Slough is just a stone's throw away. I grew up in a traditional South Asian community with a family with equally conservative opinions about what girls can do and should do with their lives. In my heart, I always knew that I wanted to be something different, to do something different with my life. And even at the age of eight, I knew that I had a great love for science and I wanted to be a scientist. Around about the age of eight, I was desperate to be an astronaut. I was so keen to fly into space as part of a NASA mission. But this, I discovered, would be a pipe dream. My family were not supportive of that. How could I fly into outer space when I wasn't even allowed to go out with my friends to the local park after school? The trajectory of my life would change on holiday to Kenya, where my family are from. We were there visiting my mother's family in Nairobi, and it just so happened that we took a, a road trip from Nairobi to Mombasa, and we stopped off along the way at this place, the Shaitani Lava Flow in the Savo National Park. And you can see me here as a geeky-looking teenager in the kind of in wearing my Sunday best, bizarrely, for a geological expedition. I, I definitely do not wear these clothes now when I go out into the field. <laughs> But I'm there wearing the, the blue and white dress with the baseball cap and knee-high socks. This was kind of the 1980s. This was the height of fashion for a teenager, if you can believe it. As I walked across these jagged black rocks that stretched across this landscape, I stopped to pick up an unusual-looking rock. And it was a piece of solidified lava I can't say exactly what happened to me on that day, but I remember, remember that moment like it was yesterday. Something inside me was awoken. I could feel the powerful story of the rock through my thin plimsolls. I could sense how this solidified mass of lava formed and why it was there in the landscape. Its place of origin was deep underneath my feet. And it existed there as a hot, swirling mass of molten fluid, moving in infinite displays of geological acrobatics. As the land was ripped apart and a fissure opened, the lava would pour out into a bright, new, cold world. And as it unleashed its destructive power on the landscape around it, it would destroy everything in its path. The local people would run away with terror and fear in their eyes. And they would call this emerging feature that would begin to call Shaitani, the devil, evil, but to me, it was anything but that. And on that day, I took away a small piece of rock and held it in my hand. But in my heart, I took its immense story away with me. Ironically, rocks have been the literal and figurative rocks in my life. While I've had the deepest passion for earth sciences, it's not been an easy journey to achieve this personal and professional ambition. I would be subject to bullying, discrimination, and intimidation throughout my working and my personal life. And sometimes from people who I thought were my friends and my allies, and yes, occasionally, there was racism. Sometimes it was overt. 
Sometimes it was barely there, hidden under the surface. In short, someone who looked like me, who sounded like me, wasn't meant to be an earth scientist. To add to those difficulties I faced in my professional life, the largest challenge of my life was yet to come. One day, I got a text from my husband to say that he was leaving me and my seven-month-old baby girl. And given everything that I'd been through to achieve what I had achieved in my career, the effect of this was devastating on my life. I would then go on to raise my baby girl on my own. But it's not all doom and gloom. And although I may not have had that support around me as I was going through those difficult times, the rocks were always there for me. This strange, enduring connection that I had with these objects, with these rocks, kept me calm, kept me sane, and undeterred from my goal and ambition to become an earth scientist and to spread my love and joy for rocks to those around me. Perhaps if the rocks could talk, they might have said, nevertheless, she persisted. To hold a rock is to hold a piece of Earth's history in your hands. This rock tells the story of an ancient Jurassic world. It's a limestone that was formed almost 200 million years ago at the bottom of a seabed, where mud would be falling gently through the water to accumulate at the bottom. This sea, this Jurassic Sea, would be filled with incredible creatures that now only exist in our imagination. And when we look at the rock, it's patterned with these extraordinary features, spirals, that are now the only remains of dead, extinct creatures that today we call ammonites. I feel an immense sense of intimacy and privilege when I hold a rock like this. It's a fragment of deep time. And it's traces of living beings that now no longer exist on Earth. And you're holding it in the palm of your hand. And you can enter this world too. You just need to open your mind and reach for a rock. One of my favorite places to go to look at rocks is Cornwall. It's dramatic, it's bleak, and yet it's utterly beguiling because the landscape is dominated by huge granite batholiths. These formed almost 300 million years ago when two continental bodies collided and they caused colossal plutons of magma to intrude into the lower parts of the Earth's crust. These intrusions would take millions of years to cool down. And in fact, if you were to wait for a kettle to come to the boil, you would have to wait for that to happen over two million times in order to make a cup of tea before that rock was cool enough to touch with your hands. This long period of cooling allowed this mass of rock to transform into wondrous crystalline structures. Quartz, spar, and mica slowly grew inside the rock. Crystals, like flowers blooming in the first sunshine of spring. Now imagine holding a fragment of this rock, this granite, in your hand. It's like holding the inner part of the earth in the palm of your hand. And for an earth scientist, this is what it feels like. This is what it feels like 
to touch a rock. You literally are touching the inner parts of the earth. And the granite landscapes of Cornwall have inspired mysterious and suspenseful, suspenseful novels like Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn and Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hounds of the Baskervilles. The rocks give a rugged, tough edge to the landscape in this county. And I'm sure when those writers went out into the landscape and they looked at the moors and the tours, they were deeply inspired by the stories and the narratives and the feelings it gave them. But what I find interesting as a math scientist is that granite, in this case, and rocks have contributed amazing things to our culture and our society. And granite in particular would go on to define the very nature of British identity and culture. About 180 million years ago, during the Jurassic period, intense magmatic activity in the Zhangji region of China caused large batholiths of granite to form, very much like in Cornwall. Over time, the minerals in this mass of rock, in this mass of granite, would weather, that, weather down and break down into a new rock. It would form a deposit of a clay mineral called kaolinite. And near this area, near a city called Jingdezhen, which is in the Zhangji province in China, there is a hill made of this rock, made of this kaolinite. And it's quite fascinating to know where the origin of the word for the rock comes from, kaolinite, because the hill which is made of this mineral is called kaoling. And we also know kaolinite by another name. It's called China clay. Now, the residents of Jingdezhen came to use kaolinite in different ways, and they realized it was incredibly useful to create high-quality and very beautiful ceramics, some of which are so highly prized today when they're found. This discovery revolutionized the Chinese porcelain industry, and it would make Jing Jingdezhen the porcelain capital of the world. Vast quantities of the ceramic ware, which had an iconic blue and white appearance, would be exported to countries all over the world. And this export would change and influence culture, tradition, and fashion, creating new trends. Granite would bring the humble teapot to the British Isles. As the Jingdezhen porcelain industry exploded, <laughs> it rose in prominence over the 17th and the 18th century. And as tea drinking became more fashionable across Europe and became more common, it would be embedded into our daily practices. Granite, kaolinite, tea. Rocks literally and metaphorically underpin our identity as a nation. We are a nation of tea drinkers. <laughs> there is another rock that I met in Cornwall that taught me a lot about human resilience and strength. And it's probably one of my favorite rocks, actually. It's a greenish-tinged rock, and it's extremely rare to see on the Earth's surface because it only exists in the subsurface, and it's called serpentinite. And it's part of the oceanic crust which sits deep underneath our oceans today. And to touch it is literally like touching one of the most deepest parts of the Earth. It is such an extraordinary rock, and I always feel a sense of very deep emotion and connection when I touch it. As two continents collided in Cornwall 300 million years ago, 
intense tectonic activity would push a rock at the very base of the Earth's crust upwards. And this rock, known as peridotite, as it was pushed upwards, began to change. The intense heat and pressure caused it to become fractured, and it would become invaded with hydrothermal fluids, which would change its very nature, its mineralogy and its structure. This new rock, serpentinite, would be forced upwards, and during the tectonic processes, it would splinter onto the Earth's surface, forming what we call ophiolite sequences. And you can see them on the Lizard Peninsula today in Cornwall. When I touched this rock, I felt I immediately knew its story and that it resonated with my own. Serpentinite is a rock that has dramatically changed and metamorphosed in reaction to extraordinary pressure. And in my own life, the fractures of grief and betrayal that had once torn me apart ended up filling me with a new vitality and confidence for my career and to serve my community. I would never wish some of the difficult times I've been through on my worst enemies, but here's the weird thing. If I hadn't gone through those difficult times, if I hadn't been forced to adapt and to change and literally metamorphose into a new person, I wouldn't be here today. I am a stronger person because of the experiences I've been through. The very events of my life I thought would break me were the very things that have helped me to achieve many of the things that I wanted in my life. The stories of the rocks all around us, the stories of rocks are all around us and within us. You too may have been altered and changed in a way that set you on a new course through life. Rocks have been my guiding light and supporting me every step of the way. I know their stories, I listen to them, and in doing so, I learn more about myself. But the problem with these rocks is that they're not very good at telling their story. They have so much to say, and yet they never accept any media interviews. <laughs> so it's been my life's work to, and joy to tell you their stories and to tell their stories to the world on their behalf. I hope you've enjoyed my story, and I want to thank you for listening to me. <laughs>